name is uh, Joe McClain. And as you can see, I'm retired. Yes, I've been retired since 2002. Before I retired, I was the uh, Director of Clinical Engineering at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C., uh, which was a multi-million dollar operation. I had over 106 people on my staff at one time, up to 144. My operating budget was about $10 million a year. But now I'm retired and, and enjoying the good life here in, in sunny Arizona. Uh, one of the things that I noticed during my tenure and during the 49 years I spent in my field of clinical engineering and biomedical engineering, uh, as well as during the time that I served as an adjunct professor for Southern Illinois University for 20 years teaching management, is that in most businesses that uh, you become very proficient in your job. For example, if you're a professional billiard player, uh, you go so well until one day your boss says, you're really good at this, uh, I'm going to make you a manager. And this is in any field, whether it's in biomedical engineering, nursing, uh, supermarket stores, McDonald's even. You become so proficient and then one day they make you a manager, but in most businesses, not all, but in most businesses what they do not do is they don't teach you management 101. You can be good at what you do, but you don't necessarily have to, have, have to be good at dealing with people. And people is the main thing that you deal with in management. Because of this, I decided to give back. I'm 75 right now and enjoying the good life of retirement. But I've had a good career and I've had uh, quite a bit of success. But I want to give back to those young managers who do not get the opportunity to learn what management is about. So on this particular website that I'm developing called Basic Management 101, I decided to put together classes that I have taught in the past as an OJAC professor, as well as from my own experiences in my past in management and dealing with people, and try to teach you the basics of a management. Uh, the, the, this, these lessons that I'm going to have on my website are going to be totally free, uh, just for you to go ahead and view and see if it helps you in your day-to-day -day experiences. I wish you all the success in the world. And I hope that you're lucky enough to become so good in your profession that one day your boss says, you're a manager, you're a supervisor, I'm promoting you. Hopefully, these lessons that I'm going to have on this website will help you to deal with that and learn that there's more to management than meets the eye. One of the key things that I will end my little introduction with is the fact that the, the way to become a good sub supervisor is this, and a good manager, is number one, uh, realize that management just takes common sense, mother wit. So use your common sense in dealing with people. The other thing, you need to be politically astute. Uh, Benjamin Franklin's grandfather said, it's difficult working for a nervous boss, especially if you're the one that's making him nervous. And last but not least, the key to being a good manager and a good supervisor is always to remember to treat people with dignity and respect. As my mother used to say to me, treat others as you expect to be treated. Hopefully you'll enjoy this, hopefully it'll help you, and I wish you a wonderful career. Thank you. Hi there, this is the first of several lessons that we will be talking about that deals with Basic Management 101. And uh, I think that in order for us to start, we, we need to start with some fundamentals about management itself. So in this particular lesson, I'm going to be teaching you the definition of management, uh, the four management functions, organizational performance, management types, management skills, what is it like to be a manager, and managing for the future. Uh, we'll call this first lesson the nature of management. The definition of management is exactly this. Management is defined as the attainment of organizational goals 
in an effective and efficient manner through planning, organizing, leading, and controlling organizational resources. Sir Robert Powell, who was a British businessman and a civil servant back in 1909, said, I always suspect a director who says he can afford to be away from the office only for a week at a time. This generally means either that he is a frightened man or else he is thoroughly inefficient and incapable of delegation. Albert Hubbard, who lived from 1856 to 1950, who was an American author, said, There is something rarer than ability. It is the ability to recognize ability. John Jaredo from 1882 to 1944, who was a French author and playwright, said, I tell you, sir, the only safeguard of order and discipline in the modern world is a standardized worker with interchangeable parts. That would solve the entire problem of management. These are just several quotes from businessmen who felt that there was a need to have a good manager. Let's talk about the four management functions. The four management functions are planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. In planning, we select goals and ways to attain them. In organizing, we assign responsibility for task and accomplishment. In leading, we use influence to motivate employees and controlling, we monitor activities and make corrections. There is an executive level management, there is a mid-level management, and there is a first-line supervisor. And all of these cogs in our machine of management interrelate with one another to make the organization work. Employees workforce, they're the people that perform the hands-on work, of course. But they need to have someone who is going to plan, organize, lead, and control them. And then the supervisors who plan the employees need someone who is going to plan, organize, level, and control them. Those are the mid-managers. And of course, the mid-managers need somebody to plan, organize, lead, and control them. So we can all be a functional machine integrating with one another and working together. Planning defines where the organization wants to be in the future and how to get there. Planning defines goals for performance, deciding on task, and the use of resources to attain the goals. A lack of planning or poor planning can hurt an organization's performance. Organizing follows planning and reflects how the organization would accomplish the plan. Organizing involves the attainment of tasks, grouping of tasks into departments, and the allocation of resources. Leading is the use of influence to motivate employees to achieve organizational goals. Leading means communicating goals to employees throughout the organization and infusing them with the desire to perform at a high level. Leading involves motivating the entire organization. Controlling is determining if the organization is on target towards its goals and making corrections if necessary. Controlling often involves using an information system to advise managers on performance and a reward system for recognizing employees who make progress toward goals. One reason for organizational failure is that managers are not serious about control or lack control information. The second part of the definition of management is the attainment of organizational goals in an efficient and effective manner. Organizations bring together knowledge, people, and raw material to perform tasks no individual could do alone. An organization is a social entity that is goal-directed and deliberately structured. Social entity means being made up of two or more people. Goal-directed means the organization is designed to achieve some outcome or goal, such as make a profit. 
effectiveness is basically, are we doing the right thing? Efficiency refers to the amount of resource used to produce an output or a product of service. Are we doing things right? The object is to be both effective, doing the right things, and efficient, doing things right, on time, first time, every time. The four management functions must be performed in all organizations, but not all management jobs are the same. There are vertical and horizontal differences in the jobs of managers. Vertical difference relates to the location in the organization's hierarchy of the manager. Horizontal differences in management jobs occur across the organization in different functional areas such as production, distribution, and finance. If we look at horizontal differences, we have functional managers who are responsible for employees with similar skills and perform similar tasks. Line managers are responsible for employees who make or provide a product or service. Staff managers are responsible for employees who provide support for line departments. Here we have an outline of horizontal differences. It shows the president, line and general managers, possibly the human resource management that deals with staff and functional managers. It could be a banquet manager who would deal with line and general managers, or possibly a guest room manager who deals with a line and general manager if we are looking at the horizontal differences within a hotel or a motel organization. Management skills can be categorized as conceptual, human, and technical. All managers need each skill, but the amount differs at each level in the organizational hierarchy. Conceptual skill is the manager's thinking and planning ability. This is the ability to see the organization as a whole and the relation among its parts. This skill is especially important for top managers. Human skills is the manager's ability to work with and through other people. This is the ability to motivate, facilitate, coordinate, lead, communicate, and resolve conflicts. Managers at all levels need human skills. Technical skills is the understanding of the method, techniques, and equipment in jobs such as engineering, manufacturing, or finance. Also includes specialized knowledge, analytical ability, and the use of tools and techniques in that specific discipline. Technical skills are most important at lower organizational levels. Technical skills are less important than human and conceptual skills as managers are promoted up in the hierarchy. Here we have a bar chart that shows the comparison between first-line managers, middle managers, and top-line managers. But the one thing that I seem to have missed through all of this is political astuteness. Yes, at all levels, you must be politically astute. If you recall, in the introduction presentation that I made, I said that Benjamin Franklin's grandfather said, it is difficult working for a nervous boss, especially if you're the one who's making them nervous. We must always be politically astute. Think of it this way. When we work in an organization, our behavior is being rented for the period of time that we're at work, eight hours. During that time, our managers or our supervisors or our CEOs are paying us to act a certain way. If we act different than that, we may just get fired. So we always must have some political astuteness. As my mother used to tell me, always put your brain in gear before you engage your mouth. There is a transition that we must go through when we leave the workforce to become part of the management of the workforce. Making the transition from worker to manager requires a shift 
from reliance on technical skill to human and conceptual skills. This is often difficult as strong technical skills may have been the basis for the promotion to the supervisory position. If we look at the vertical differences then, we start in an organization as an unskilled worker. We climb that hierarchy and someday become a semi-skilled worker. With the assistance of OJT on the job training, technical school training if required, and other training, be it the formal training in a university, college, or at a trade school, we become a skilled worker. And then we move in towards the managerial progression to become a first-line supervisor, and then a mid-manager, and hopefully if we're successful, someday we become an executive level manager. So what is it like to be a manager? Managerial activities are diverse, characterized by a variety of fragmentation and brevity, handling significant problems mixed with trivial events in no predictable sequence, fast-paced and require a high level to be successful. Management is an art because many skills cannot be learned in a classroom. Studying management helps but that alone will not make one a successful manager. The human and conceptual skills and roles take practice. Management is also a science that can be learned from teaching and textbooks. A successful manager blends formal learning and practice, which is actually a blend of science and art. A recent study contrasted derailed executives with successful executives. The successful and derailed executives all had excelled in technical skills. The derailed were successful early in their careers but were fired or forced to retire early. In the derailed executive major flaws were insensitive to others. Remember treat everyone with respect and human dignity abrasiveness. You do not like to be talked down to and other people do not like to be talked down to. Always remember that your employees can be equal to you. Aloftness. Never think you're better than anyone else. There's an old saying that says, be nice to the people as you climb the ladder to success. You may need them when you go back down. Arrogance. Never think you're smarter than others. Never be arrogant about your position. It is important to realize that all of us together are smarter than any one of us alone. Inability to take a long-term view of their organization. This can be the difference between success and failure in a manager. This concludes our first lesson. We will start really into the meat of everything very soon. Thank you.